tonight's going to be amazing, and uh, this is something that I would highly encourage you to attend at 6 o'clock. We're going to be going deep into the scriptures, but uh, you're going to see Jesus in a whole different way that you've never seen him before. Do you guys ever hear of Where's Waldo? <laughs> Where is he, right? Uh, we're going to discover Jesus like we've never seen him before in the Old Testament, and uh, it's going to be amazing. This morning, we are going to get into our next series, which is called Appeal to Heaven. And how many have ever seen this flag before? The Appeal to Heaven flag. Take a good look at the flag. All right, take a good look. Now, this flag is a picture of what we want to talk about and what we're going to be discussing over the next couple weeks, especially with everything that's going on in our nation. And we have to be ready to appeal to heaven because the most important thing we can do right now is to come into alignment with the kingdom of God and to appeal to the greatest authority, whoever was and whoever will be, the name of Jesus. How many are grateful that we can always appeal to a higher authority? President of the United States is not the highest authority. We appeal to heaven. So the phrase appeal to heaven appears in um, some, some writings by a man named John Locke. And his writings was what helped form our American Constitution. And he wrote this. He said, and where the body of people or any single man is deprived of their right or under the exercise of a power without right and have no appeal on earth then they have a liberty to appeal to heaven whenever they judge the cause of a sufficient moment. What he's saying is that if there's tyranny or if there's injustice, I may have experienced injustice before, that we need to learn not just to appeal to the earthly authorities, but to go to a higher authority, <laughs> right? And that is in prayer. And that's what we're, that's what you and I need to do in this season is to appeal to heaven. This is a significant time and a Kairos moment. Now, many of you don't know this, like I didn't know this, but this flag, the Appeal to Heaven flag, was on the first ships of the Continental Army in 1775. There was six, it was before the U.S. Navy, but they actually flew this flag, and it was a picture of a pine tree with the words, Appeal to Heaven. Let's all say that. Appeal to Heaven. How many believe that we need to start Appealing heaven right now. Amen? This is a time and a season. And I want to touch on today in this first part, this is going to be a little mystical and a little different. And I'm going to stretch you a little this morning. But it has to do with how God operates with this planet. How God operates not just with the people on the planet, but also the very earth itself. And when we discover how God operates... It's gonna, I'm going to go back into the scriptures and explain to you some of these concepts that I think will be helpful. So when we look into the Word of God, how many know God planted man and woman in the Garden of Eden? We read in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter, we're going to go back into Genesis chapter 2, and it says, the Lord God planted the garden in Eden in the east, and there he put man who he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there's a picture here that God made man from the dust. How many know that you're made of dirt? I think there's about $1.59 worth of metals in your body right now. That's about all you're worth in the physical realm. But into the heavenly realm... You're worth the blood of Jesus. So you're very special and very worthwhile. But God created man from the dirt of the ground. We're made of the same elements. And what happened is, is then God, he breathed his life into man, and man became a living being. How many of you guys are alive this morning? All right. Yeah, amen. All right. You're alive because God breathed his breath, his spirit into you. How many know you're created in the image of God? But God created you from the dirt. He created you from the ground. Now, the Hebrew word for ground is the word Adama. Everybody say Adama. And it actually sounds a lot like Adam. Adam was the first man, and he was created from the Adama. 
He was created from the ground. So we have been taken out of the dirt, but we still have a connection to the ground. Many of us aren't farmers. We got any farmers in the house this morning? Any farmers in the house? Sort of. No, not really. It's kind of crazy because 98% of us used to be farmers 100 years ago. Now only like 2% are. Now it's all backwards. But the ground to the farmer was everything. It's how he fed his family. It's how he survived. He understood how the ground worked. And I want to talk today about how the ground reacts to things that are done upon it. This is a, a concept that you're going to see here. It starts right out in the book of Genesis. But the first thing I want you to fill in, how many know that the ground gets stubborn? There's three S's I want you to fill in on your worksheet. That the ground gets stubborn. It will refuse to give fruit. It refused to give fruit to Adam, and it stopped giving fruit to Cain because of the things that they did on the ground. Remember, Cain killed Abel. What happened? The ground said, I'm not giving you any fruit anymore. Is that weird? Like, how many are worried about their tomatoes because there was a murder on your street? You're like, does that matter? But in the Bible, I'm going to show, can I show you this today? Are you guys alive and well today? Okay, I want to stretch you a little bit because this will bring understanding. The ground actually responds in an independent way because of the way man acts, governments act, because of the way cities act, people act upon the ground, it actually determines whether the ground will produce fruit or not. Let me show you. Okay. So Adam was formed from the earth and was responsible also for the curse. How many know the ground was cursed when Adam sinned? What did the ground do? It didn't do nothing. It was just laying there like dirt. And then Adam sins, and what happens? The ground gets cursed. You guys follow me so far? Come on. We're, we're walking through this. And it's also realizing that he, Adam, was tasked with cultivating the earth. He eats the produce of the earth. And when he is done in his life, where do, you, where do we put people when they're done? Stick them back in the ground. We're all going back in the ground. How many know that, right? Right from dust to dust. We're going to return there one day. But we have a spirit inside of us that will live forever. So let me show you in the scripture. I have a picture from Adam coming up from the ground, right? God created Adam from the Adama. Adam, what's the Hebrew for the ground? The Adama. He was created. God breathed his spirit into him. But then in Genesis 3.17, after Adam and Eve, they disobey the Lord. This is what the scripture said, Genesis 3.17. Cursed is the ground because of you. Did the ground get cursed? It says, now, through painful toil, you will eat fruit from it all the days of your life. So before, when God made the Garden of Eden, it was, it was misted every day. It was like you didn't even have to mess with the garden. But now, because of sin, what happens is that now man has to toil by the sweat of his brow because now the ground has become stubborn. Then we go on to say, I'm going somewhere with this. He goes on to say, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and dust you shall return. Then Adam and Eve, they have a son. They have Cain and Abel. And then Cain kills Abel. And because of the blood that was shed in Genesis 4.10, the Lord says to um, Cain, he says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And verse 11 says, And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Verse 12, when you work the ground, what happens? When you work the ground, what happens with Cain now? No longer is going to yield him any fruit. He's not getting tomatoes. He's not getting zucchini. He's not going to get anything. The ground... Come on, are you guys follow me so far? Am I making my point? Yeah. And you know how like the Native Americans, they, they called it Mother Nature. And nature is never meant to be worshipped. God is the creator of all things. We worship God. We worship his son, Jesus. But the earth is in covenant with God. The earth itself, it operates almost like a living entity. It refuses to give Adam what he wants. It makes him toil. For Cain, it completely says, you're not getting nothing. 
Have I made my point biblically? Yeah. We're almost there. Here we go. So the ground becomes stubborn when man commits evil deeds. Now I'm going somewhere. How many know what? There was a hurricane this week. There was a hurricane Helena. There was hurricane Milton. As I say, was it Milton? And what happened is we have to ask ourselves why. Why are there natural disasters that come upon the land? Why are there earthquakes? Why are there hurricanes? Do we pray against these things? Are they of the devil? Are they of God? Or is it the ground cleansing itself of the sin that was committed upon it? Come on, are you guys, I want you guys to think about this. Now, when Jesus rebuked the storm, why did Jesus rebuke the storm? Did the devil make the storm? Now, he wouldn't rebuke his father if he rebuked the storm, right? What if that this is the operation of the ground cleansing itself from the sin that's committed upon it? Let me read you a scripture. And this is a very famous scripture found in 2 Corinthians 7.14. It says, if my people, any God's people out there today? Okay. Who are called by my name, that's us, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins. And what? I will heal their land. What's up with the land? I'm not a farmer. I'm not, I, I don't think like this. You and I don't think like this. How many know God wants to heal our land? And many times what takes place is the ground is, is responding to the evil that's being committed upon it, and it's cleansing itself. It's, it's, a, it's kind of a mystical thought, but the scriptures see that when we repent and we humble ourselves and we seek God's face, and I'm going to show you something at the end of this that's going to blow your mind, God will actually even bless the very ground. It'll become more fruitful, more productive than you can ever imagine because of the way we live our lives. Hmm. You guys aren't convinced yet. Let's continue. All right. Here we go. And so... He talks about Cain. He says it's never going to produce. And look at what the Bible says in Romans 8, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 20. It says, for against its will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin. I'm not making this stuff up. It's in the Bible. Sometimes I make stuff up, but I'm not doing it today, okay? Right? It, it's this, the universe is suffering. The very ground is suffering because of the responses of man not living right before God. Even the very ground. But it says, but now with e eager expectation, there's, there's something that, that the ground is expecting and awaiting for something to happen. <laughs> How many know that heaven is not a place we go Heaven is coming to earth. That's the ultimate goal. That Jesus and the Father are returning to planet earth to take back the planet. We're not going somewhere. Heaven is coming here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you can get excited. Anyway. Okay, this is where it gets a little gross. But the, the, ground, <laughs> the ground will be stubborn when there's sin upon it. But when it gets really bad, you know, the Bible says the ground will actually get sick. That's the next thing you want to fill in. Get stubborn, and it gets sick. Now, what happens when you get sick? You don't feel well. You can't walk straight. Sometimes you even, but right? There's a great children's song. It goes, you got to throw up. You got to throw up. You got to throw up your hands. I mean, it's kind of, it's a great kid's song. We can do it next week. I, we think Austin will go over really well. Um, but the, but the, the ground will actually, the Bible says, will actually spew you out. Let me read what it says. The ground gets sick. You've never heard anything like this before, have you? Ha, here we go. Come on, walk with me. Leviticus 20, 22, it says, 
Keep all my decrees and laws and follow them so that the land where I am bringing you to live may not vomit you out. I didn't write that. That's the Bible. What's it say? It says, keep all his decrees and follow them or the land is going to going to vomit you out. Come on, it's in the Bible, right? I'm not making this stuff up. It's there, okay? The land itself is responding to how we live our lives. Why do you think it worked? People all over the world in America were praying that this hurricane coming toward Florida would dissipate and and the walls of it would break down, and the destruction that was expected, remember on Tuesday? It's like, it's going to be horrible. And it was still bad, but praise God. How should we pray against natural disasters? Well, it's God's will. No. It's not the devil. The devil doesn't have that powerful. I mean, I know they can do stuff with the environment, but that's a whole nother, <laughs> it's a whole nother talk right now. <laughs> but how should we pray? Lord, we command, like we should command the storms to stop. Amen? We should be like Jesus. Peace be still in the name of Jesus, right? Why do we do that? It's because it's a response. We're actually, God, forgive us. We repent, Lord. We humble ourselves. We come before you. We appeal to heaven. And then God will heal, heal our land. He wants to heal our land. But there's an if in that statement. It's if we do our part. So I want to show you, what does the land look like? I have a couple pictures after like a tsunami or a natural disaster. What does that look like? It looks like somebody just vomited, doesn't it? It looks like the land just vomited it up. Go ahead, next one. Right? I don't like to use that word vomit on Sunday morning. I don't know why. (laughs) <laughs> right? Right? And so we see this in the Bible, and it talks, Jesus talks about, you know, how many remember Jesus talked about he would spew you out, right? Remember what it says in, in the book of, of Revelation? He's, he goes on to talk about, he says to the Laodicean church, he says, I know your works, you are neither cold nor hot, would that you were either cold or hot, So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. It actually says in the Greek, because I looked it up, he will vomit. And what's that say? There's actually a picture. What I love about the Bible is you begin to study it. You begin to study the environment and the context. And you look at this city called Laodicea, which Jesus was speaking to. There was two other cities in in about 10 miles from Laodicea, there was the city of Colossia and there was the city of Hierapolis. And Hierapolis had amazing cold water. It was, it was known for its cold spring water. And Hierapolis was known for its wonderful hot springs, like hot tubs, right? And Laodicea had no water source. So they had to get their water either from the hot springs or from the the cold water up from a city different way. And whenever the water arrived at Laodicea, guess where, what temperature it was? It was lukewarm. So what Jesus is saying here, and most of us have always thought, like me, that Jesus said, either be on fire for God or be a terrible sinner, right? Be hot for God or just be cold and turn your heart away from God. Isn't that the way most of us have been taught that? That's not what it means. It means either be hot, which is useful, or be cold, which means be useful. Because cold water is useful to drink. Hot water is useful to take a bath in. And so God's, Jesus isn't saying, you know, either be on fire for me or be 100% against me. He's saying in both circumstances, be useful. And that's what he wants our cities to be. He wants our nation to be. He wants our leaders to come into obedience with what the commandments are. And we need to be praying faithfully for our leaders right now because there's a lot to navigate, a lot to navigate in this season. In a city itself, and we ask ourselves, well, why did that hurricane hit Florida? 
Why didn't it hit Richmond, Indiana, right? Why isn't there destruction there? It's because we have to view ourselves as together, like a corporate, a city is a corporate thing. When God brings judgment on a, on a nation, it's, it's random. It's not like we all experience the same level of judgment, but we're, we as America are under judgment because of decisions that are being made by our leaders and by the decisions that we make as a people. So if we humble ourselves and come before the Lord, the Bible says he will heal our land. And so it's important right now to spend time doing your declarations every day, praying, interceding, praying for those who are serving God, getting into office. Like we're praying, we're appealing to heaven. Remember, when Yahweh came, when God came to visit, he, he visited Abram, Abraham, and he came and, and God was like, I'm going to go down and destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. How many remember that story? And what does Abraham do? He begins to intercede with Yahweh, with God, to spare the city. You guys remember that conversation? Genesis 18, 20, it says, Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, verse 21, I will go down to see whether they have what they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. So Yahweh actually comes down, and he's going to see what is going on in Sodom and Gomorrah because he doesn't know. Kind of throws, throws out the idea of omniscience and... Uh, being at God being everywhere, God knowing everything, that story just throws all that out right out the window. You're like, well, he didn't know. How come he didn't know God? Aren't you? He chose not to know. He chose not to be everywhere. But then God's going to go down there and check out what's going on. And then what is Abraham thinking probably at this time? He's like, oh, I got some family down there. I got Lot and my, my nephew Lot and his family down there. And then Abraham it says this, then Abraham drew near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Verse 32, then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak again. But suppose 10 are found there. So Abraham actually goes through the process with Yahweh interceding. Lord, would you spare the city for 45 people? He says, yeah, I would. And he goes, How about 40. And the Lord says, yeah, I would. He's like, 35, 35, 35, 30, 30, about 25, 25, 25, 30. You know, he's like bringing them down, and they get to the place of 10, and God says, I will spare it for 10. But do you understand, this is our process as a people, is that God wants to know you're here on earth right now to intercede for our nation and our city. Like every day, like we should be praying, especially for Donald Trump right now, praying for him and interceding because we are... <laughs> There's a, a Marxist government that has arisen in our society. Be praying for our good friend Micah Beckwith. All right? Does everybody know who Micah Beckwith is? A pastor. He's been here to preach. He's uh, on the ticket for lieutenant governor. We need to be praying for him because he is bold and he's standing out. And so we're praying. And Abraham prayed and he interceded. And God relents from sparing the city well, he doesn't relent. He, he destroys the city, but he gets Lot and his family out before it happens. How I many of oh, God wants to still do that? And he said he would spare it if he found 10 people. How many we got here today? Let's count off. Do we have 10 here? Right? Like God would spare an entire city for 10 people. Just 10 people. 10 righteous people who have humbled themselves and call on the name of God. How important it is your prayers, my friend, at this time. <laughs> How important is your humility and say, God, we need you. And to repent. Like, don't just repent for your sin. Repent for the, your heathen neighbors, you know. Lord, forgive us for our sin. Forgive us for turning from you. That's what, that's what a nation does. And Jesus wants us to come into that place of intercession. It's so vital that we do that now. So the ground would actually respond to sin that was committed upon it. When we repent, God will heal our land. How many want God to heal our land? 
if we humble ourselves and pray and seek your face, God, you will heal our land. That's what, that's what this message is about today. That's our appeal to heaven. God, do it. So the ground will get sick. Now, the other odd thing that I'm going to show you today, and I want to show you a video clip, is that the ground must also be still. It gets still. It needs to rest. Now, we know this today in modern technology, that you let your ground rest. You don't always work your ground. You leave it to rest. Did you know that's a biblical concept? That the Jewish people, when they were called to go into the land, they could work the ground for six years, and then they had to leave it rest on the seventh year. And if you didn't, if you didn't let your land be still, you were sinning against God. You were violating his word. You know, God, is, God loves rest. God wants you to rest. Did you know that? He doesn't want you working and working and working all the time. Like, there's something on the power of being still and resting. But did you know that the nation of Judah, they were kicked out of their land for 70 years. Does anybody know why it was 70 years? Because they never let their land rest for 490 years. I have a chart up there real quick. How many like charts? All right. All right. And it basically says that they were kicked out of their land. They lived there for 490 years. And because they didn't let their land rest once every six years, they were banished from their land for an entire 70 years. Like, who would think God would kick them out of the land for 70 years? Like, it's the farmer's fault. Thanks a lot. You know? Of course, everybody was a farmer back then. Okay? But let me read you what it says in 2 Chronicles 36, 21. It says that he carried into exile to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword and they became servants to him and his successors until the kingdom of Persia came to power. Basically, he says that they were taken captive by a foreign people for 70 years. And then it says this. It says in uh, verse 21, it says, The land enjoyed its Sabbath, Sabbath rest all the time of its desolation. It rested until the 70 years were completed in the fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Huh. So the land needs the rest, too. I'm trying to convince you this morning how we're con more connected to the ground than you may have realized. And that God views how we treat the ground, and the ground will respond. The ground will be stubborn. The ground can be violent. The ground can respond because of the way that we live our lives. That's oftentimes the reason for a lot of these natural disasters. God wants us to recognize the power of rest and the power of coming into obedience with God's word is vital. And I want to share a quick video clip because Deb and I watched this uh, video series about cities that were transformed by the power of prayer. And this is a story about a city. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the name right here. A city named Alma Longa in Guatemala. And this city experienced a great revival. Prior to the revival, there was gangs all throughout their city. There was alcohol. There was bars. There was drunks all over. They had four prisons in the city. And the video clip I'm going to show you right before this video clip that I showed you, it interviews the sheriff of Almalanga, Guatemala. And you know what he says? We don't have any more prisons. Because revival has come to our town, and 90% of our community is now believers and followers of Jesus, so we don't have prisons anymore. So, and he's just telling the story, like what happened when the pastors came together and prayed, and the city came together and humbled themselves, and not only did God heal the, like, heal the people, did the people stop sitting? Because that's, that's what revival is, is when people are hungry to get right with God. But not only did that happen... The ground itself 
began to produce like never, ever before. So go ahead and show this video clip. Al Malanga, Guatemala. Turn up the volume, please. Even the town's agricultural base has come to life. For years, crop yields around Al Malanga suffered from a combination of arid land and poor work habits. But as the people have turned to God, they have seen a remarkable transformation of their land. And Al Malanga became a fertile valley. It is so fertile that the land is so, so good. They produce the best vegetables. They get as many as three harvests per year. They sell their vegetables to Guatemala, south of Mexico, and El Salvador. Before the spiritual turnaround, growers were exporting four truckloads of produce a month. Now they leave town 40 times a week. Nicknamed America's Vegetable Garden, Al Malanga's produce is of biblical proportions. You have to see them to believe. A bit is four and a half pounds. A carrot is this size. It is, it is just unbelievable. It... It's bigger than my heart. It's a green grocer. How many want carrots that big right there? Right? So do you, come on, let's give God a shout of praise. Isn't that good? So even, even the very ground began to be transformed and changed as we repented and as we came into alignment with God's word and his kingdom and we repented, we humbled ourselves, God began to move. And how many know that's, that's what we're called to do? When we look at the appeal to heaven flag, it's a picture of a pine tree. And pine trees are different from most trees because most trees have leaves on them that fall off. And I believe it's a call of us that we need to become pine trees in this season and not just regular trees. What are those called? What are they called? What are the other ones called? I can't say that word. What is it? Sicily. Okay, thank you. So we need to be trees. And let me give you some points about what the Bible says about us being trees, in Psalm 1, 3 and 4, it says, He will be standing firm like a flourishing tree planted by God's design, deeply rooted by the brooks of bliss, bearing fruit in every season. couple things about pine trees that makes us different is we can be stable in every season. That's what a pine tree does. It's never barren. Did you notice that about the pine trees? They're never barren. They're always green, and they're always pointing toward heaven. That's our life. We're called to be pine trees, not trees that are losing their leaves every season. We're not affected by the seasons. Friend, we're not affected by what goes on around us. We're not thermometers. We're thermostats. We don't go around saying it's cold, it's cold, it's cold. What we do is we change the thermostat, we're thermostats, we change the temperature wherever we go. We're not affected by what goes on. We're stable because we're pine trees. Psalm 1 says, he is never dry, never fainting, ever blessed, and ever prosperous. Can you put up that verse? Let's say this together. He is never dry, never fainting, ever blessed, ever prosperous. Any pine trees out there this morning? Come on. One more time. He is never dry, never fainting, ever blessed, ever prosperous. That's what we're called to be in this season. Pointing to heaven. When people look at us, they see us pointing to heaven. And people are like, you know, what does a sign do? What does an arrow do? An arrow points us to somewhere. And maybe I'm a little flashy sometimes, but I'm just a flash and arrow, man. That's all I'm doing. Point people to Jesus, right? Point people to the truth. And that's what you and I are called to, be, to do. Romans 8, chapter 20 says this. I'm, I'm almost finished here. It says, all creation longs for the freedom from its slavery to decay and to experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children. Did you know the very earth is waiting? It's on its very tiptoes waiting for us to realize the revelation that we are sons and daughters of God. That's, that's what creation is waiting for. In verse 19, it says this, 
that the entire universe is standing on tiptoe. I love that. Yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. That's the next great event of the church. It's for you and I to be unveiled as God's sons and God's daughters. And the creation itself is waiting for that very thing. Come on, let's stand together as we close. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your goodness. I want to take a minute, and I just have some prophetic words. Um, Bill, I just want to say, can I share something with you? Prophetically, I just want to say, like, your name means to be a strong protector. And I feel like that the Lord just wants to call you out today and say, he's seen your work, he's seen your labor, he's seen your care for your community and your friends, and he just wants to say how proud he is of you in the stance that you've made and the direction that you've made. And I want to bless you today. I just feel like that you have been a, a protector for people, a lover for people. And I just feel like the works that you have done, like that you have you have made a memorial before God in heaven. It's been beautiful. I know you you work hard. <laughs> You're passionate about what you do. But I want you to know you got the eye of heaven. Can we stretch our hand out toward Bill this morning? Father, we just thank you for Bill. We thank you for his heart. We thank you for his dedication to you, Lord. And we pray, God, you give him supernatural. Just put your hand on him. Give him supernatural encounters. I feel like the Lord is going to take you into some supernatural things, Bill, like you've never seen before. I know you come from a, a, a more denominational church, right? And I believe God's going to take you into a greater experience in the spirit realm. Um, I feel like you're a Cornelius in this season. Cornelius is in Acts chapter 10. And I feel like there's some encounter that God's going to bring into your life. And he sees your heart. and He sees your labor. And we bless you today, Bill, in Jesus' name. Thanks for letting me share that, Bill. God bless. <laughs> Shelby, Shelby, is that Shelby? Is that Shelby? Shelby, I feel like the Lord is just encouraging you right now to um, I feel like you have a real hunger and heart for those who are hurting and broken. And I believe that sometimes you, you put yourself in situations that are challenging. But I want to encourage you, like, get your strength from the Lord. Like, the, the, the pain that you feel for others, I believe, like, you're like a pearl that's, that is made beautiful. It's, an, you know, a piece of sand gets caught in an oyster. And it irritates the oyster until it becomes beautiful. But I feel like that's the call on your life. Like, God is, you're going to get beautiful through irritation and through stepping into some difficult things. Is that you? Do you like to step into difficult things? But I just feel like the Lord is going to, there's some decisions you're going to make. And like there's the favor of God is all over you. I want to encourage you like to be bold and be strong in what God has for you. Let's stretch your hands out to Shelby. Father, we thank you for Shelby today. We pray for your life, God, to continue to flow into her, Lord. We thank you, Father, for a river of God to break out in her, Lord God, like never before. And Lord, she's going to refresh many, God. And we thank you, God. Thank you for that, God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you for it, God. Thank you, Lord. Kenny, I just, um, Kenny, I feel like the Lord wants to encourage you today. I feel like the Lord is, uh, He's, he's taking you out of that hidden place. I feel like there's a healing that's coming. Um, can you put your hand on his shoulder? I just want to pray. Lord, I just release healing into this man's body, Lord God. I thank you, Lord, for your touch upon Kenny. I, I, I feel like there's, a, there's something that's been a Band-Aid that's been on your life for a long time. And like the Lord is getting ready to pull that Band-Aid off and to really bring some, some healing. I don't know if it's, if it's a physical thing or something else, emotional or something, but I, I just believe the Lord has his hand on you, and I just release over you, Kenny, today that uh, just a fresh encounter with the living God, and Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for this man. I thank you for the work of his hands, Lord, but I thank you in this season, Lord, you're going to do a deeper work in his heart, Lord, and you're knocking at his heart, Lord, to take him, draw him closer to you in this season, so we just release health and wholeness over him physically, mentally, and emotionally, God. 
in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thanks for letting me pray for you, Kenny. Thank you, Lord. Let's give God a shout of praise. He is good. Come on, let's stretch our hands out to God this morning. We're going to make an appeal to heaven this morning. Father, we pray. We declare over our nation today. We humble ourselves, Lord. We need you, God. We repent, God, on behalf of our nation, on behalf of the, the sin and rebellion of our nation, God. We ask that you would forgive us as a country, Lord. You would spare us from the just judgment that we deserve, Lord. And so we come to you. We appeal to heaven, Lord. We pray that all tyranny, God, would be overthrown. Lord, we take this flag, God, and we say, remember us, God. Heal our land, Lord, as we commit to pray for our nation. Commit to pray for those godly leaders, Lord, seeking to bring your kingdom here, Lord. Seeking to fight off evil, God. We stand in the gap this morning for our nation, Lord. And we ask that you would spare us, Lord. Forgive us and heal our land, Lord. We appeal to heaven today in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it, God. Father God, I thank you that you are raising up new leaders. And Father God, with this election coming, I feel that the season of the, uh, the politicians, these career politicians that have just been feeding off of the, the, the people is coming to an end. And Lord, just like the appeal to heaven, Lord, our early founders, Lord, the leaders were the warriors. George Washington was a soldier. He was a warrior. He knew how to fight, Father God. He went through the battle and he came forth like gold. And Lord, I just declare that over our nation. Lord, that you are raising up warriors that are tried and true. Lord, that their heart is to fight for our nation and for our people. Not for their good, but the good of our nation. So, Lord, I pray in every state, every position that's out there, Father God, that you would raise up God-fearing leaders. Lord, that the pride of life would be brought to null and void. And that your kingdom would come. <clears throat> your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, Lord, we thank you for a new season for our nation. In Jesus' name. break the cycle because when we study the scriptures, I want to tell you today there's a difference between sin and iniquity. Sin is what we commit that separates us from God. When we repent, when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive them. But what happens is there's this other thing called iniquities. Everybody say iniquities. Iniquities are not sins you have committed. They are sins that your previous generations have committed. Your mother, your father, your grandfather, your great... There's 40 people, 30 to 40 people in previous generations that when they sin, just like we talked earlier, when Abraham tithed, there was a blessing that was sent down to a previous generation because of his faithfulness in his giving. Because the Bible basically says that you were... Levi, his, Abraham's great-grandson, was in his loins when he did that act. That's what the Bible teaches. You are not born with a clean slate. You were born with iniquities that were passed down from you up to the third and fourth generation. Come on, how many have seen some cycles going on if you were born, you know, Tarzan and Jane was your mom and dad. You know what I'm saying? Like you see some generational stuff going on. You're like, and you go, where did that come from? There's suddenly like a, a person is living on fire for God and suddenly they've fallen into something dark and, and horrible and terrible and you're like, I did not see that one coming. That's an iniquity. That's an iniquity. Now you and I, we could get upset about this right now. Well, what do I do about iniquities? But can I tell you that Jesus' blood not only forgives your sins, but it covers the iniquities of your forefathers. Isn't that awesome? I remember when I got that revelation, I thought, man, I thought it was good to be forgiven, but 
man, Lord, you'll forgive everything when I bring it before you, Lord. Forgive previous generations, Lord, for you know, homosexuality, Lord. Forgive our sins for, the, for anger or violence, Lord. Forgive us for murder. Forgive us for witchcraft. Forgive us for uh, stealing from you and not giving to you the glory that you deserve. Come on, there's a lot of sin that can happen to 30 or 40 people in previous generations. How many know that to be true? Come on, I know that you were, you know, Mother Teresa. Anyway, you got some rascals in your past, don't you? And if those sins are allowed to remain there, the devil will use them to bring judgment on your life. But when you take them before the Lord, this is how powerful the blood of Jesus is. You'll find this in Nehemiah 9, and Daniel 9, and Ezra 9. Lord, we confess our sins and the sins of our Father. Come on. You confess. I've gone through and looked at every sin in Deuteronomy chapter 28, every curse, and I've said, Lord, I went through that. I repented of every single thing that could possibly be on my family line. Because the buck will stop here with me. It's not continuing on to the next generation. It's not continuing on. The buck stops here with me, here because of the blood of Jesus. Now, when we talk about the temple of skin, remember when Jesus when Jesus walked to the planet, the reason Jesus was crucified is because he made this statement. What was, what was Jesus' statement that got him crucified? Does anybody know? He talked bad about the temple. Now you can talk bad about my mama. You can talk bad about my grandma, but don't you talk bad about my temple. Hmm? That's why they killed Jesus. That's why they killed Stephen, the first martyr. They killed him because he talked bad about the temple. Read it in Acts chapter 7. They would, they would gnash their teeth. How dare you talk about our system? How dare you talk about our temple? There was an anger and rage that came over the religious people of that time because they become so accustomed to their temple in their way, and God was about to change it. We don't want to make their same mistake. God's changing things in this season. How many know that? We don't want to make the same mistake and resist what God's doing. So Jesus says this in John 2, 19, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up again in three days. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up again in three days. And then the religious leaders of that time, they said, it has taken 46 years to build the temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? Now, what did they do? They took this statement literally. They thought Jesus was going to be the next terrorist that was going to blow the temple up. Oh, we're not going to let you do that, Jesus. But how many know Jesus wasn't talking about the temple of stone? He was talking about his temple. Interestingly, they said it took us 46 years to build this. Did you know each cell in the human body has 23 pairs of chromosomes? 46 total chromosomes. What did they say? It took us 46 years to build this temple. He goes on to say, Half come from the mother, the other half come from the father. Females have two X chromosomes. Males have an X and a Y chromosome. By the way, that never changes. Put me in a dress, I'm still got an X and a Y chromosome. Put makeup on me, cut a body part off me. Guess what? That doesn't change. Your cells do not change. You're forever a man or woman. They'll dig up your dead body 10,000 years from now, and they will say, you are a man or a woman because of this 23 chromosomes two sets of 23 makes 46 was that prophetic jesus was not talking about a temple of stone he was talking about his body is the temple he says you destroy this 
you crucify me, but you put me in the graves and I'll rise again. That's what he was talking about. You see, there's a danger. Sometimes when we, we hear the voice of Jesus, we hear these things, what are you saying, Lord? And we may take some things literally, like the book of Revelation. We can take some things literally that they're not meant to be taken literally. Jesus was talking prophetically about the temple of skin that was coming to planet Earth. So that you know, now that we're talking about DNA and chromosomes, that each cell, what we have here, this is your DNA. There's bridges that keep your DNA together. They hold the DNA. Remember we said there's two sets of 23 chromosomes. These bridges actually keep your DNA together. And interestingly enough, they come in patterns. It's a repetitive pattern of 10, then 5, then 6, then 5, then 10, then 5, then 6, then 5. Put up the chart in Hebrew. If you look at the numbers of the Hebrew letters, a 10, a 5, a 6, and a 5. Yud, He, Vav, He, which is the name of God in the Bible. So image means we look like him, and likeness means we are able to be like him. That means we have authority when we speak. We have power. We have authority. We can call things that are not as though they are. Just like God created the universe through the words that we speak, that's why the Bible says the power of life and death is in our tongue. Now, people can get wacky with this. I'm not saying that we're to be worshipped. The Father and the Son are being worshipped on the throne. I get that. No problem with that. But listen to that. The same spirit that made Adam came alive when, he, when God breathed his spirit into us. And we literally took God's breath away when he made us. Think about that. He breathed his spirit into you and I. What does that mean? I, I think the spirit is so mysterious. <sighs> and something happened inside of us. The divine nature was imparted into us. In Genesis 1.27, says, so God created man his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now notice, God says there's two genders. I'm going to say that again. There's two genders. You have a trillion cells in your body right now. They're either two X chromosomes or they're an X and a Y chromosome. Follow the science. You can't choose your own gender. No matter what you cut off, what you twist, what you turn, your DNA never shifts or changes. That's the science. So if anyone tells you differently, you should speak out against that. We are created to image God, to be his imagers, you and I. We're called to look like God. Isn't that good? You're an imager. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, you're an imager. <laughs> The image is not an ability we have. It's not like a spiritual gift. Oh, I have the spiritual gift of, of image. No, you are created with image, the image of God. You're an imager of God. It's not an ability, but we have a, but a status. We are God's representative on earth. To be human is to image God. So God created us with this intention that he wants us to be like him and to be in his image. And to rule and to take dominion. But we hear so much from Christian today, it's about being nice and being kind and not offending anybody. How many know this is the time to be offensive? It's where we're at because of what's happening in our community and our society. And we're walking a narrow road, can I tell you? It's lonely there sometimes. But we have to stand in truth. We have to stand. You know, we have, there's a difference between animals and human beings. What is happening today in our society is we have legislators that believe that a baby seal or a baby eagle has the same value. So what's happening in our community is you have smart, supposedly smart people who actually believe that a deer or a cow has the same value as a human being. It's stupid on steroids, it is. But that's, that's the mentality that people think. We have state legislators now who pass laws that will punish anyone who endangers the life of a potential baby eagle. 
in its nest? How many have been at the beach before? You can't go near those baby turtles or you'll get fined or punished. But we have the right to, to kill potential baby humans in the womb. You understand, when, when state legislators stand before God and he's going to say, you protected baby eagles or baby turtles and you did not push laws that abolished abortion when you had the power to you to do that, shame on you. There's a difference. There's a difference. We are made in the image of God. We may, we also have the image of man, but we're created in the image of God. That's what makes us different. That's what makes life sacred. That's why we fight for life. where I think some Christians don't just let go of certain situations and they think they're doing the right thing when they actually need to stop praying because so, yeah. there's many times that there are situations and I can tell you I've been in situations that were very difficult uh, relational situations that I felt like oh I, I just need to pray for this person but because the situation was so toxic it was, the Lord was like, you need to stop praying for that person and just give them to me. Let somebody else pray for them because every time I would pray for them, it was uh, such a toxic situation that I felt, uh, I felt almost defiled. So if God says, let that situation go, you need to let it go. If you start praying for something and you feel like, man, this is, I don't feel like this is my place to pray for it, then it's important that you do not cross that line because maybe you're a very merciful person. Oh, I just want to pray for this person. Friend, sometimes God says, stop praying for them. You may be shocked that this is actually in the Bible. Uh, Jeremiah 7, 16, the Lord says to Jeremiah, therefore don't pray for this people. Don't lift up a cry or prayer for them or make intercession to me for I will not hear you. So there's times that God says, stop praying. And if you continue to pray, then you're operating in disobedience. And again, friend, you know, there, there's a time for mercy, but there's a time when God says, listen, you may think you're being merciful in this situation, but you're actually being disobedient to me. And we never want to cross that line. And I want to share about um, something called unsanctified mercy. Okay. And this is a uh, something that I had to learn, especially as uh, in, in ministry position, that we oftentimes we default to showing mercy to people when we're giving people mercy that God says don't give mercy to. Now there's, when people are, let's say they're in this self-pity mode and you may feel drawn to help them, but if it's if God says don't help them because there's a spiritual thing happening in their lives right now that if you help them, you will not break that power of self-pity over their lives. And if you help them, then you're actually in, encouraging them to continue in that mode. So we have to recognize uh, when we're giving mercy that's truly from God's heart or if we're giving unsanctified or unholy mercy that's not authorized by God. Because I only want to do what like God calls me to do, I will do. But I don't want to do what God hasn't called me to do because I'm limited in the amount of resources that I have. And there are people that come and ask me for things and I have to be able to listen to the voice of the Lord and be obedient to say yes or no. Remember, so if somebody... Even when it comes to prayer, that there are certain things that we ought not pray for. God may say, stop praying for that. And there are certain people that God may tell you, don't pray for them. We have to deal with those areas of our life that we can be seduced by pride or seduced by people's compliments 
And it's, a, it's an important journey I think we all take as we're learning what it means to um, be a worshiper and to lead others in worship. And in ancient times, interestingly enough, uh, most kings only allowed a certain class of people around them. And this class of people were called eunuchs. And if you've never heard anything about eunuchs, it's, um, it's not a pretty story, what, uh, what I can tell you. Um, traditionally, eunuchs were castrated males who were put in charge over the care of the royal women in the king's palace. So here we have eunuchs who had actually gone through a procedure on the most private part of their bodies. I'm sure it wasn't very, um, it was sure it was quite painful. So that uh, basically they would have no, they would lose their desire for the opposite sex. And um, you could not even apply to be around a king unless you had first gone through that process of becoming a eunuch. And what's the picture here? I think the picture is this, is that you and I as worshipers, as leaders, we're not called to bring attention to ourselves. We're here to prepare the bride for her king. And if we are not castrated like a eunuch, um, we'll have a desire for, their, for, for the bride to be attracted to us. And that's one of the things that uh, we have to become eunuchs if we're gonna be worshipers.